Hello, welcome to Industry AF. My name is James Frolio, joined by Tyler Boone, and our wonderful guest today is Jada Kelly. Jada Kelly is a beautiful songwriter with a gift for serenading and strumming your heartstrings. Described by CBC as one of the shining jewels in the crown of Canadian songwriters, Jada Kelly spends her time writing and living between rural Ontario and metropolitan Los Angeles. She's co-written and toured with the likes of Whitehorse, Judy Collins, Catherine McClellan, Royal Wood, Kelly Prescott, Peter Katz, and so many more. She's also performed and showcased her music across Canada, the United States, and Europe, as well as performing notable festivals like Americana Fest, Winnipeg Folk Festival, Calgary Folk Festival, Edmonton's Interstellar Rodeo, Metal Toronto, Peterborough Folk Festival, the list goes on. Also, if you thought Americana was the scope of her talents, guess again. She's the featured vocalist with Juno Award-winning metal group Protest the Hero. Mm-hmm. With a staggering list of accolades, the Canadian Folk Music Awards, the Hollywood Independent Documentary Awards, Screen Composers Awards, Oshawa Music Awards, and network television placements from CBC, Lifetime, ABC, Amazon Prime, and Hulu, it's quite obvious that Jada's songs carry weight, soul, and some deep substance that is truly rare. Her latest release, Roses, boasted impressive editorial playlist placements on all platforms, as well as landing the front cover on several editorial playlists on all major DSPs. Jada spearheaded the collective Canada Covers Tom Petty collection, as well as a semi-annual Canadian songwriter showcase here in Los Angeles through the Hotel Cafe's Monday Monday Songwriter Series. You can find Jada on Twitter and Instagram at Jada Kelly. Jada, welcome to the show. What an intro. Thank you. Of course. I liked that intro. Happy to have you. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm uh, so, so excited to have you on here because I just feel like uh, you're so sweet and nice and humble, but like you really do have a lot going on. So, you know, so thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been in L.A.? Um, July will be five years. Um, okay. And before that, I was in Nashville for a bit, but... Um, I think we might have lived in Nashville at the same time, right? I think so. 2015 to 17 yeah. for me, so yeah. I just didn't know you, but that's awesome. Um, yeah, L.A. definitely feels better for me. I feel like as some of my favorite songwriters live in Nashville, but here just you can wave your freak flag a little higher. Totally. I just feel like You'd be LA more yourself. Is, yeah, L.A. is a gift I have given myself, and I, I, I don't know how long my, my California chapter will be, but I do... Love what's happening. And now you're living in Altadena, right? Oh, yeah. I used, I used to live there. You did? Yeah, we talked about this. Oh. When okay. we first moved in, I was just like, I used to live there, and like, there's the houses you can drive by, they're really nice. Oh, and yes. I lived um, on the main street. Uh, this was a while ago, but it was it was cool. I, I think it's beautiful up there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a basically a retirement community. Yeah, it's, you know, but but it's like, it, it's not too far. <laughs> yeah. And you can di- you can dip right down to Pasadena, go get a drink, yep. you know. There's some cool bars in Altadena. Oh, yeah. So. No, I love it. It's cause before I moved to Altadena, I was I was like, do I move back to Canada? Is it is this city life too intense? But when I saw Altadena, I was like, no, this is like I am a mountain girl now. <laughs> I am a mountain woman. This is a quieter pace. Totally. So I'm, I'm enjoying it. Oh, awesome. It. Yeah. Well, killer. Well, Mountain woman. Yeah, man. Well, let's, let's, fire, <laughs> let's fire up some questions. <laughs> so I was checking out your Spotify, and the new album's wonderful, but um, something really caught my ear as a reggae and Bob Marley fan. You just released a cover of Stir It Up. Yeah, you were talking about this last um, night. Mm-hmm. And it's such a simple yet powerful rendition and reimagining of one of my favorite songs. We already know Bob Marley. We know you love Tom Petty. Um who are some of the people you look up to in this industry, and who are some of your favorite songwriters? I think we could start there and then move into your music. Well, um, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. That the most influential songwriter to me would be Patty Griffin. 
Mm. Um, when I was about 14 or 15 and I started taking guitar lessons, so my guitar teacher introduced me to her, and that blew my mind. That was my first introduction to Americana, because up until that point, I was just listening to Top 40 Country every day, all day. Mm. Like, my whole family, that's all we listen to is country, old and new. Um, and so that was that was really blew up my ears. I'm like, oh, this is this is deeper. <laughs> this is this has more poetry to it. This is has more feeling. And so that's really she guided me. I love Patty Griffin with all my heart. Um, so cool. And really, all my favorite songwriters are from Nashville. Even the artists like Maren Morris. Um, saw her recently at Hollywood Bowl, and I think I blacked out from happiness. <laughs> it was like, well, you love you love Rustin Kelly too. Oh, Rustin Kelly, my God! Uh, but you like Rustin Kelly, huh? Oh, I love Rustin there Kelly for different reasons than you like him. <laughs> <laughs> and what is that? I don't know. <laughs> Are we shy? I think he's a single man. I don't know. He has the same last name as me. It would be very simple. Uh, <laughs> the paperwork could be really easy. I like this. Very <laughs> simple. You just move in. <gasps> Are we sharing our favorite Nashville songwriters right now? Um, in my family, I was a huge uh, John Prine fan, oh, and yeah, I know he that. used to share a writing room um, before he passed with Sturgill Simpson. Ooh. Another one of my favorites. He's not from Nashville, but um, I think he still lives there. I love Sturgill. Um, <clears throat> Sturge. I used to manage a band called Driving and Crying. Mm. They're 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 like a record collection. Like they could be punk rock, they could be Americana, they can be old eighties rock. That's what they first started as, and. Uh, when Sturgill won Country Album of the Year, he fired uh, Little Joe, the Estonian guitar player, mm. and then he joined Driving and Crying, and I screwed up big time because when I, I – Sturgill put SNL, and that's when he, like, kicks the piano, and they're just, like, rocking out. <laughs> and I was just like, holy shit, you know? And then he joined the band, and I totally fan- – like, I was, like, taking care of this band, and I just was not cool. I got really drunk, and I was like, dude, you're incredible, and the band's like – you're at, you're at a 10, we need you like a, like a 5, calm down. But I love Sturgill Simpson. Mm. Uh, we knew one of John Prine's kids, too. He lived in Charleston. Really? Jack, right? Yeah, we, I produced the EP with him. Really? Yeah, yeah, he was a nice kid. And I never got to meet the John himself, but um, his whole family was super nice. Yeah. We're still friends with Jack today. Yeah. yeah wish him the best. <clears throat> he lives back in Nashville. But, um, but yeah, but I love Americana. And oh, that, yeah. And that, the night we met, we met at, what bar was it? Um, the Tavern? In Studio City. Yeah, well, we met at Laurel Tavern. Uh, a piggyback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a, yeah, it's on YouTube. I, I, posted, I put it on there. Uh, but we went to Laurel Tavern, but then we went to karaoke at the Barrel. Yes. Right across from the, from the chimney sweep. Yeah. And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I play music. You're like, I do too. And then also I was like, oh, and it was just really cool because I was like, I love Americana and uh, it's it's cool to find other people that love that genre, you know. So that's and it cool. seems like you guys have this whole other life. Like you guys are relatively new to LA too, right? So you have this whole other life of recording artists in Charleston. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've been my fans from California, but I've been yeah. living here since 2019, so I guess I'm still fairly new, yeah. for sure. You know, yeah. Charleston's a whole scene. It's very mm-hmm. indie. You know, and my first band was in Atlanta, where I grew up. Atlanta, a little garage band called Pandemonium. Pandemonium. <laughs> As two words. <laughs> That was great. Yeah, I like bears. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we, but we both came from Charleston, man. That was we did. It's a, uh, it's a it's a different kind of scene. It's a good scene. There's a lot of good festivals there. I own a festival there. It's getting pretty big. Called oh Hol- yeah, <clears throat> called Homegrown Holy City Fest. You played it last year. It's going to be uh, at a much bigger venue this year, which is really neat. But um, mm-hmm. Charleston's cool. You know, uh, Shelves and Rope are from there, and they have the High Water Fest, which is all Americana bands. Oh, I see. So um, it's they're, a they're whole different world down here. Like Toronto too has an amazing music scene. Really, and um, it's very similar to like what you guys came from. But I feel like a lot of Canadians we, we have to leave Canada to find more success. Diff- yeah, because there's a ceiling in it's Canada. To- it's totally a glass ceiling in Charleston too, and I'm not hating mm-hmm. on it. I just, you know, you eventually left too. It's like you play all the big venues and you're like, well, I don't want to be 45 still doing this. I yeah. need to try and, you know, if I if this is what I want to do, I need to go take the chance, you know. Mm-hmm. Once so. you've checked all the boxes, it's time to introduce some Something uh, new. Some what's, adversity. What, I always ask you this. What's the freaking saying where, like, if you keep repeating the same thing, it's crazy or... The definition of insanity, insanity is repeating the same thing and expecting different results. Yeah, yeah. that's the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, you anyway. sort of have to do something scary. Cause, uh, <laughs> you have to push yourself. If, if you're choosing to be an artist, if you're, if you're choosing to go down a path of 
possible poverty. <laughs> you really have to throw yourself into into cities and writer writer rooms and scenarios that your regular nine to five or wouldn't think You're about right. doing doing. So it's yeah, I always whenever I go home for Christmas and people are like, How's LA? They don't want to hear the reality. The reality is that it's so hard here. Totally. It's hard to make this choice. Yeah. It's a very isolating city, but it has the potential to change your life. Yeah. So it's that's something I'm very conscious of living here in LA and it's like, yeah, we we, we could have stayed in our hometowns and playing the same venues and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think we all collectively want more for ourselves. We want to have a, a beautiful career. Quote, unquote, you know, whatever make it means to you. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> and I think L.A. actually is great. You know, I mean, you know, there's there's a cookie cutter thing you can do, which like, you know, when Machine Gun Kelly came out, all of a sudden everyone started doing that. And then when Billy Ice got big, everyone started dressing like that, you know. Yeah. And when I go to like a typical L.A. showcase, like those like local showcases they do where they just like, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. That I'm not going to mention their names, but, um, you know, everyone's just like playing the tracks and, yo, what up? And you're like, ugh, you know? know. But, like, the showcase you put on at Hotel Cafe with all the Canadian writers, it was just so nice. So you know? nice. You know, and that's an amazing room anyway, so. It's a listening room, too. Yeah. So, like, some showcases, everyone's kind of having a drink and bumping shoulders and trying to kiss babies and whatnot. And, <laughs> and Yeah. And those those types of rooms, like, the Monday Monday series is so special for me, too, because oh. everyone hushes up and is really hanging on your every word and every note. And Yeah. Yeah, it's very beautiful. When, when you got to open up for me... You came, December. Oh, it was such a I rock was so, and show. I was so drunk. Your oh. whole band was loaded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 you know, I kept calling you Judea, too. So I was like, Judea, come here. I'm like, Aaron's like, you're saying her name wrong. I was like, oh, my God. But you're you, not the, the first I know, or but, the last. But I knew how to say your name. I was just drunk. I was like, all right. <laughs> but you got to open up, and people just loved it. And you're like, dude, that was a great set. And it was a great set. That's a cool room. Hotel Cafe is great. Love to play. Oh, that was yeah. you opening. Yeah. He was wearing it's his all, jacket, I think. It's all coming together. Okay. <laughs> I chopped the mop, I think. That's, that's yeah, adding to Oh, your hair is idea. cut. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, Jada, I feel like we can just dive in deep. Like, Let's you just... go deep. So, why do you write music... <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. It's the name of my new album. <laughs> how, deep, deep. how deep can how I go? Deep. Just dip it. No, this is so <laughs> such a wide question. Take this take this any way you'd like it, but why do you write music? And what does it like do for you? Um why? Um I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> I'm a slave. I love it. We, we can keep it poignant and short. Your music is incredibly. <laughs> <laughs> I could have gone further with that. It's okay. no, let's keep it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think your music is incredibly beautiful. Um, when does most of your writing happen for you? Is there a process that works for you? Do you have a ritual that sparks inspiration, or you just kind of sit down and put your nose to the grindstone? Um, that's a that's a good question. I've actually been observing. <laughs> been talking to a lot of artists about this um my neighbor is a member of the pretenders <laughs> cool and we wow. like go for coffee and he's like become my my mentor he's just like a neighbor and in altadena that's wild and we were talking about i was like do you have certain times of the day where you're more creative are there certain circumstances where you find where you're, you're more fluid and he was and i was like i feel like when i'm in the shower if i'm in water if I am on a walk, if I'm driving, but specifically at like 11 a.m. <laughs> and 5 p.m. every day is when I'm most creative. He's like, yeah, that's your lucid time. Mm. I was like, oh, there's a name for it? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that happens to me at this time and this time. And it's, I find that when I'm, um, if I condition my day and my year to be as balanced as possible, spiritually, mentally, and physically, if I... If I keep everything balanced, that's like that's me keeping the gate open. That's when ideas just arrive. I don't have to look for them. So totally. that's like uh, no one. I feel like when I decided to become an artist, I didn't know the creative process, and maybe everyone has a different one. But for me, I've started to recognize there's different times in the day, and then um, yeah, I go out of my way to make sure that I'm calm and comfortable and. Um, because that's, that's the most beautiful thing to me, is that it just arrives. I don't know where it comes from a lot of the time. Uh, that's wonderful. I have a question. 
<clears throat> uh, I always like to ask this: Do you write the music first and then the lyrics? Or, like, what do you do? Um, I guess uh, the melody will always come first. Okay. So I'll just keep a whole phone folder of ideas that come to me. Um, or when I'm watching movies, like last night, one of the characters was talking about what was your first memory. Um, and then I was like, what was my first memory? My first memory was a sun shower. And so I just wrote a song last night called Sun Shower mm. about just cataloging what my first memory would be and what my last memory would be. So that was like, yeah, I never what know cool what's going to happen. Yeah, don't take it, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> we have a record right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't you dare write a song right yeah, now. Don't you, dare, <laughs> don't you dare, <laughs> boy. Don't you dare, boy. It's so funny to do a southern accent. Oh, we should change our accents <laughs> for the rest of this interview. God. God, just damn we'll, it. We'll just drink more of this, and I'll be like, I'll tell you what, God damn it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, us being from the South, too, like, you know, I, my accent can get can come out sometimes and I, I hear know it. it. And uh, yeah, and if I'm like at a bar in LA and I'm drinking I'm, and I'll just say y'all or something <laughs> or tire or like something yeah. like that. So I'm like, where are you from? And I'm like, shit, I've been discovered. Oh you no. Know I mean? you know? Well, with me, it's the Canadian accent whenever I say about. about. Yeah. yeah. And I get called out on it. We had, a, we had a guy on the back. Called out. Out. <laughs> called out. We had a guy earlier, Hoogie. He lives in Ontario, I believe. He works oh. for Shinedown. He was on the podcast and he kept going, Iboot. Oh. Iboot. Yeah, he's awesome. Love that guy. Anyway. That's awesome. Jada, what do you find yourself writing most about? Um, well, lately, um, I've been writing about um, heartache hmm. um, and letting go. I've, I've, I guess the latest song I've been writing is just exploring um, the, the, the period between um, letting go of someone like, uh, and, and grieving like when you're not quite over it, but you're not as bad as when the grief started. Like you're somewhere in between those places. Yeah, I write. I write a lot about heartache. I think like my my 2016 album was called Love and Lust. Mm -hmm. That was like <laughs> that was my Carrie Underwood with the uh, the baseball bat album. That oh. was like um, I had been with my drummer for four years, and he had an affair with one of our fans for two years. Oh man! And so that. I really just, I can't not, I have to write about it. And totally. that's my favorite album. Um, I wow. love writing about heartache. I love sad songs. And I'm, I'm a very jovial, happy person. You yeah. are. <laughs> you are. You are. But, um, I mean, it just, you, you feel so much more, um, you know, you're creating something and you just, it's like you're really pouring yourself into it when it's about heartache, you know? Mm -hmm. Most of my songs always are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. even, if it's, even if it's like a song in a major key, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds happy, but it's a sad song. Yeah. Those are some of my favorite songs. You know, I find <clears> it so curious how, like you said, you're such a, you're so full of joy. We're having laughs right before we started recording and, uh, and you're writing these like deep, sad songs. And, um, I used to work with this guy who was in like a hardcore metal band, like, like, you know, mosh pit. You, you really got to you really got to watch out for some some hands and feet flying around at his shows. But but when I was working with him before I knew he was a musician, he was the most well tempered. Hey, how's it going? You know, like <laughs> nicest guy ever. Usually so metal guys are like that. It, it Well, it's just funny how that works. You yeah. Know? They like, usually have like the the nice clean cut hair, and they definitely mm. make a sleep, but they're just like very stoic and it's interesting. You know? Yeah, you know, like oh, how are you doing, Mrs. Prescott? You know? <laughs> Would you like to come to our band show? <laughs> it's yeah. like chairs flying. <laughs> well, maybe because they have such like an intense outlet for their anger. It's that... cathartic. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, are you? Are, do you have any more shows? No, let me ask you this instead. I, I know you have shows, but uh, do you have any like cool tours coming up? Like you did, like in you just did a Europe European tour. Oh yeah, that was my first tour after three years wow. of pandemic. Yeah. Um, oh god, yeah, I got COVID Look, the first day. Oh no, was Airline. it bad? <laughs> yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Airline lost my guitar, but it was. Um, oh my gosh. It was it was a hard tour. But it was beautiful to get back out there. I went um, back to Canada, back to Europe, but currently nothing. Planned. I okay. feel like that tour just took it out of me. It's good to take breaks. Yeah. You know, I'm only playing two shows this year. Okay. My festival, and I'm probably in the year I'll do an LA show. Right. Because I just want to I want to record like 20 songs. Yeah, it's not necessary to be out there. It's like we're not... Well, you I'm th breaking even when I tour. And yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It can, it can, then, you can, then you can be pissed off like, why am I playing music? I'm just going broke. Yeah. So you got to make sure you still love it. But, you know, uh, I think the reason is, and not just music's for comedy, right? 
is you feel like if I don't go back out there, I'm going to lose my momentum. Mm. And you just, you're thinking too hard about it. You know, people like it when you go away for a minute. <clears throat> yeah, and they you come do. Back, you know, so. It's sort of like a, a different part of the psyche. It's a different beast. Mm. Um, it's like, I have to step into those shoes. And I feel like when I went on this most recent tour, I was <laughs> every day I felt so tired. I don't know if that was because of the pandemic kind of changed my tolerance for the pace of tour but by the end of it i was like i can do this for nine more months <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you um yeah it's like, it's like you built up to it by the end of it yeah it was, it was it's like um getting to know an old friend yeah tour jada you, is very you, different from stay home and record jada you said something on a show once um and i was like interesting and i was like i kind of do miss that too but i don't want to say it out loud because i don't want the pandemic to ever come back again but you said something uh you're like i kind of missed the pandemic and people were like huh and you're <laughs> like well because of these little communities that we built of like can i please come over and hang out with you yeah and it really brought people together you said something like that once oh yeah yeah, yeah. um i do miss the pandemic elements of it yeah um I, I felt like, you, you know when you're a kid and there's a blackout in your town or there's a big snow day and everyone stays home and it's like this collective thing that you're all experiencing together? Totally right. That's what the pandemic felt like. And you were all forced to be with each other. It felt like we were 13 again. Mm -hmm. um, for, for at least me. I know everyone had a different pandemic, but for me, I had an amazing friend group and they helped me finish this album. Really? Yeah, in is in okay. isolation. So this is Roses, right? Yeah. Put it up and see. I was thankful for the pandemic because yeah. it gave me extra time to, to finish this thing. Where's this picture? That's hmm. um, in Hollywood. Hollywood? On a rooftop. On a rooftop? Yeah. Do you remember where? Just curious. I used to live in Hollywood. Um, Franklin and Tamar's where I used to I live. forget the intersection. It's near that Scientology building. <laughs> Darth Jada? Yeah. What is that? That's, that's her website. It's my website. What? I, my how do I not know that? <laughs> Darth, I thought that was so great when I clicked on that yes. link. Oh, my God. That's so cool. That's so funny. Uh, okay, cool. Let me ask you this. So, like, this is your on your label. Do you have, like, someone helping you work with that, or are you, you doing it all by yourself? Um, what do you I do, pretty what do you, much do everything on my own. I, I used to have a manager. Mm -hmm. Um and we did a lot of great work together in Toronto, but when I moved to L.A., we parted ways, and I've just been holding the reins on my own, and um, it's it's been good for me to How to you, do everything on my own. Yeah. I mean, I love being independent. Oh, it's amazing. You know? I mean, I had a record deal once. I had to buy back all my music for thousands of dollars. And Not I made, necessary. And I made them probably about five grand. Ugh. So it was like, the, in those two songs, Yeah. and I was just like, I need these back. And I was like, wow, that cost me like 10 grand. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, those assholes, you know? Yeah. And so then I started my own label after that. Um, yeah, for, what, for we, artists today, it's not really necessary. No. I mean, if, you know, obviously if you get a big deal, it's because they have the money. You know, yes. It's, a, it's just a bank account. Um, well, who, who are you distributing? Okay, with? so my one team member that I have, it's my digital distributors. They're in Nashville, and they're called Tone Tree. Oh, yeah, you told me about this. That's the best relationship I've ever cultivated because they get my songs on every every Apple playlist, like that Bob Marley cover you mentioned, uh, Stir It Up, that's currently on this like acoustic covers playlist on Apple, and it's going up by like 100000 a week. That's incredible. And that's money for me. That's, that's insane. Like, you know, because of them, because of at least five of the songs got on huge playlists, that like five million streams, I could pay off my car with that. I was able yeah. to quit nannying because of that. That's amazing. So it's, I'm, I, even on my way here today, I was just beyond grateful that I was coming to do a podcast and not going to change diapers. Totally. So <laughs> well, you know, I, people people hate. Unless that's something I have to do here. Totally. <laughs> not, yeah, not here. Not today. Not today. All of a sudden a baby comes out, you know. Um, Live on camera. <laughs> go! You know. <laughs> do, 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 do. Timer, you know. Uh, you're fired. Uh, um, no, uh, I, people hate on streaming. You got to embrace it. Oh, and if yeah. you know how to do it correctly, you could actually make revenue from it. Yeah. You know, people all the time, like, you see all these podcasts or, like, what do you call them, panels, and they're like, oh, streaming. I mean, yeah, it's not, it, they pay them shit. Oh, yeah. And the reason why is because, I love the music business stuff, is because the major labels bought into Spotify, and they're all public companies, and they have to just keep growing. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they did pay out the streaming, like, they do this too, by the way, um, and that's why the road is so low, but they also do this, like, the reason why you'll see Post Malone on New Music Friday when his new thing hits is because uh, he's not getting paid the same dividends that we get paid, right? Mm. He's getting paid a different rate because uh, Spotify went to Warner or whatever and goes, all right, can we have access to your catalog? How much? Mm. And they pay for it, and then they could just jack it up 
and everyone can listen to it, and he's already he already got paid. You know what I mean? Interesting. And so that's why uh, it's just such a different hierarchy. You know what I mean? And mm. people always want to hate on it. It's like, well, dude, it's honestly, it's if I was a musician in the '60s, I, I probably wouldn't make it. Now you have the internet. You gotta just you know you just have to adapt to it. Yeah, you we're I, we're definitely not making enough, but yeah. I think we have. To, you're right. We have to embrace it. It is what it is. It's way above our pay grade. And so either get with it or don't. You yeah. Know? So, and yeah. technology, I think, is always advancing in the favor of of us, you know? So, I, you know, in these coming years with, like, I don't want to talk too much about it, but, like, you know, blockchain and all these things that allow, yeah. like, creators to sort of create their own communities and own their own revenue streams, I have a lot of hope for, for the future. So yeah, I mean, I like, dude, cool. I never thought I'd start a podcast, you know what I mean? But it's all about content. You know what I mean? It's just, like, technology is what I'm saying, so... And that song is so relaxing, too. I was listening to it the other night, and I was like... The Stir It Up cover? Yeah, you, oh. you said last night. <laughs> yeah. That was your, awesome. Your sleep song? <laughs> We're talking a lot about music. I, we should, like, hit some industry stuff, too, but I have another question that I really wanted to ask because I wrote, like, how do you know when a song is done? Or rather, how do you know when a song idea is worth pursuing till the end? I'd love to oh, know. Wow. That's a good question. That's a great question. Um, I guess I just feel it. I, I, I've done, like, there's this one of the songs on the album called When I Fly. I had four different versions of it with different producers. Oh, wow. And and we ended up just going with the demo because I couldn't let go of the demo. I was like, this is more than demo-itis. This is just we got it right on the first time. Yes. Well, you had like you had like four different vibes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and everyone did it wrong. Yeah. Not well, they didn't do it wrong. I know what you mean. They just didn't. We captured a, a an energy and a beauty, and um, we ended up just in the last minute. I was like, let's just go with the original. We're only calling it a demo because we're calling it a demo. Mm-hmm. So yes, I guess I just I feel it, and um, that's the beauty of being my own manager is that I get to decide what goes and what doesn't. I don't have yeah. a huge... I have friends that are on huge labels, and, like, a friend of mine is country singer. She's on Warner, and she has a whole team she has to go through with her demos. To like, make creative I personally, decisions. I'm like, oh, that's obviously the hit, but it's... um, You have other people making decisions, like what's actually going to work in the country market. Well, you know, one thing I can't stand, because artist formula, we work with so many different people, when someone, you know, it's like an old concept of like, let me consult with my manager, and most managers don't know what the hell they're doing. They don't. And they're just like a project manager who's like either maybe getting paid monthly or who knows, right? And then, you know, let me, let me discuss with them, and I always get so pissed. I'm like, why do they have to make the decision? You know what I mean? You are the CEO. They should be like your assistant, basically. Exactly. You know, I can't yeah. stand it. But let me go talk to my manager, and then maybe I get on the phone with them, and they're just like... Tyler and I'm like, oh, get out of here. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, dude, why are you and why? You know, I don't know. I just can't stand it. I think yeah. I think it's so much cooler when an artist is just like in full control. You know? Oh yeah, and yeah. that that yeah. roses the album is really a reflection of me taking control again. Cool. Because I'd say my previous manager, we really made decisions about what songs would go on the next album, and I felt like we just we were not on the same page. So every song that is on that album was my choice. Which feels really empowering. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know if you saw the track with Stupid, Stupid Goddamn Face. <laughs> Is that about a boy? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> They're all about a boy. <laughs> That's funny. This is segueing perfectly into all these questions, but um, if this album, Roses, your most recent release, if this could send a quick message to everyone listening, what do you think that message would be? Mm, uh accepting abundance into your life hmm. recognizing that abundance is falling all around you all day long um, and just finding ways to clear the bullshit and reach out and grab it to reach out and grab success that's what that album is to me cool. I love that I think there's a lot of uh, you know obstacles in the music industry and mm-hmm. we can like we were just talking about streaming doesn't pay enough and, and x y and z and and sometimes we can get caught on those obstacles when uh you know you can kind of turn it around so i appreciate that you've done that yeah Thank you. yeah that's that's why after i got to know you a little more after we met i was like oh like she gets it you know obviously we don't all get it 100 percent. we don't know what's going to happen but that's also the beauty of it you know it's like i'm just going to do it yeah. you know 
And uh, I just, you know, I just love hustlers. You know what I mean? So hustlers. Yeah, yeah, totally. I love it. If you're, if you're, if you're, if I hear an artist go like, "Why I should be my success should only be merited by my song," I'm like, "Get out of here." You know what I mean? Because yeah. the next person is like, I, you know, it's 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 kind of a dumb saying, but I think it's true. Ninety percent sweat, ten percent talent. Mm-hmm. But that ten percent talent better be fucking dope. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And if you're if you just outwork. Uh, if you do 50 hours a week at your craft for a year, you're gonna be ahead of everybody else, you know? Yeah. So, and I just feel like you're a hustler, you know, because on top of that, you also grant right too, right? And this is a very cool, uh, occupation you have. I'm, I'm so thankful for it. So in Canada, we have, um, we have grant support for the arts. Amazing. Um, and this other cool thing called healthcare. (laughs) Take note, America. It's all I don't have health insurance. I should go get it, you know? But so, um, since I was 18, I've, I've had access to these grants, I, every album I've put out, every tour, every video has been funded by the Canadian government. Um, and so I, I've gotten to a point now where I've, I write my own grants. That whole album was funded by the government, and I own it. I'm about to move to Canada. <laughs> yeah. But on top of that, I started writing grants for my friends, and they started getting them. And now I'm at a point where I have about 60 clients. And so that's my full-time job when I'm not making music is writing grants for artists um, and it's cool. It's like related to music. Oh yeah, completely. Mm-hmm. It, it's really exciting to see some of my younger clients get their first grant, and they got to be ecstatic. Oh yeah, they're just crazy. They don't understand the concept. I'm like, no, that's your money. You don't have to pay it back. Just put a logo on the back of your album. What yeah. is the the pitch to like? It's like, hey, Canadian government, we're going to enrich the cultural and musical environment of the world and Canada specifically. Pay up. Exactly. And it's all from taxpayer money. So um, mm. when I when I, I was playing a show once and I had a grant officer come to one of my shows, he gave me his card. He said, you need to come in for a meeting. We need to talk about you applying for, for grant support. Like he came to me. That's dope. And he, he was an, an ex-artist. Like he, he threw in his, his, his guitar and threw in the towel and he, he joined the grant world. Mm. Um, and he sought me out. And he really, um, he said, this money is here to enrich um, Canadian culture, because when where there is culture, there's a healthy society. What a cool way to think about life. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Or I, I feel for the United States. It's so uh, we're doing our damnedest out here. We're we're both making music and and moving the culture. You know, pushing the tree <laughs> in the direction we think it should lean. But I also say there, I do um, envy Americans to a certain degree because I think some Canadians rely, rely too heavily on grant support. And they're not actually looking for real revenue sources. Hmm. I feel like Indeed. you guys are just forced to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, that's why I did that. Yeah, this you know? is your grant support right yeah. here. But, I mean, you know, uh, our buddy Rafa was on the podcast, comedian. You might be sitting right there. Uh, <laughs> he, we're talking about, and I, I can relate to music, is uh, this happens a lot, too. People just put out too much bad shit, mm. too. And so it kind of ruins it for everybody. You know what I mean? Because all of a sudden you're like, well, maybe I need to become an Instagram musician, you know, and I mm. can't stand that, you know? Yeah. But, you know, then you have to just basically put your blinders on, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But but then, but that's also the market. And so then people look at, like, well, someone's successful because they got 100,000 followers on Instagram. It's just a lot you have to deal with these days. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's, it's so much, you know? It's endless. And um, you can get lost in it and you can get really depressed from it, too. Oh, endlessly. Yeah. I, I, I talk to my friends a lot about this because obviously TikTok is so annoying and so amazing yeah think think about before social media bands would just go to the town that they're playing a week before and poster the entire town yeah uh, there's a good interview with dave Grohl. he said back in the day we had these uh (laughs) these like certain things they called it and they would mail it to someone in the town that they knew and goes please yeah put it up yeah poster that's how you did it yeah I don't even, I mean, I should do it, but sometimes when I tour, like, you, you go, I, every time I walk into a video, I go, ah, oh, shit, I didn't do it, and they always have, like, the flyers there. Yeah. I even do that half the time. Yeah. Because that's money, and you got to send it, and it's like, yeah. when I go to a venue, I don't really look at the, oh, cool, that band's coming, so I'll be back. I go because I saw the band online. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know, I just find it interesting how it's, like, all different change, but, I it mean, James different. James just toured. He just did it all across the United States, basically. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we did forward some material to some of the venues, and it was cool when we showed up. It was it's up some, there. Sometimes it'd be a big venue. And sometimes, like, we played this bar in San Luis Obispo, and then the little flyers, you know, it's like an Irish pub, but, like, there's mm-hmm. the flyer. So it's yeah. cool. You know, um, yeah. definitely takes some effort to, yeah. uh, 
wade through the noise and use the tools and not be used by them. Yeah. Speaking of the online stuff, you know what, what I mean? What a quote. Damn. Oh, damn, son. What's up? What's up, gang? Mic drop. <laughs> I literally can't drop this mic, but... Um, it's too expensive. I don't, I don't, I don't own it. You know. <laughs> it's not so, in the budget for me to drop. Exactly, thing. yeah. Jada, your music, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it's super beautiful music, but um, how did the metal project sneak in there? Is your alter ego, like, this, like, wild metal singer, like, <laughs> no. breaking whiskey bottles and stuff? Can you tell us about how that project came to be? Um, so, uh, the metal group Protest the Hero... We grew up together in the same town, cool, in Whitby, Ontario, and they they came to play our high school, and everyone knew who they were. They were these fourteen year old metal prodigies, and they would play the dungeon every week. And the dungeon, yeah, <laughs> Dope. In, in Oshawa, and I, I I do not listen to metal music. I don't. Um, I, I love Protest the Hero. I I love all all of their work, um, but I. I was not, I was not a metal singer. They just kind of found me because I, I met, I went to their website after they played our high school, and I was like, I'm a folk singer, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they just they so they had my demos. Like friends of friends had sent them songs I'd recorded when I was 14. Cool. Um, and and so that's how it started. And so I've pretty much sang on all of their albums since, and they will, they'll just tour with my tracks. Like with my voice singing, okay. wow! But I'll have what cool is that? I'll have people come up to me like at every show. The, there's always one where he's wearing a dark hoodie at the back of my folk show. And he's like, and he's like, hi, are you Kaziya? <laughs> <laughs> is that your stage name? <laughs> yeah. Wait, what's is... your full stage name? Kaziya. Kaziya. Oh yeah. wow, that's crazy. Yeah, wow. that's so cool. And they they always have. I let them have their moment, and I just. I love it so much because it's like they're internally crumbling. Because um, it's you. It's me. I'm Kazaya. Well, I will always be Kazaya. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of like when you go to like Comic Con or something, and people f- geek out because it's the voice of the their favorite cartoon or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like oh, oh my god, oh my god. Well, that's really like cool. That's the real name of like the Sith Lord Darth Jada. <laughs> I know. Kazaya. Darth Jada, aka right. Kazaya. I real. know. Well, hey, I, I, you know, simple question, but just because I, I love playing guitar, what, what, what guitar do you love to play at home, and what guitar do you bring on the road, or do you just have one? Ooh, well, um, you probably have a million guitars. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two. I have um, a, a Tele um, that I've just started playing live with. This guy. That's her. Her, I mean. <laughs> her. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's um. It's Please. made by a. Toronto guitar maker named Alistair, Alistair Miller. Cool. And he takes old recycled Tele hardware. Oh, um, dope. And it, so it's rosewood and um, uh, barn wood. It's called the barn caster. No way. And it's, it's my. That's cool. Instead of, <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> Musicians don't buy houses, they buy instruments. That's my investment for the future, but I love it. I have a lot of them. Well, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I'll let you. You should borrow it. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. You can borrow one of mine. Uh, you would probably dig the, uh, J- James loves it, the Silver Sky PRS. Silver Sky. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, it's like butter. Yeah. It's yeah. Just like spreads right on toast. I'm, I'm, I'm endorsed by Taylor. I can maybe oh. introduce you to them. I get all, I get free acoustics from them. Sure, I Mike, like free Mike things. Mic drop on that. Um, <laughs> they're, they're from San Diego. They're not too far, so you can okay. go down there. So, um, well, awesome. Yeah, okay, cool. So just two. Awesome. Just two. Just yeah, two. my other one's just a Gibson. It's a parlor-sized acoustic. I generally always tour with that one, but I, I don't know what prevented me from playing live with my electric for so long. I think I've just felt like because I can't shred, I, sh- I have no business being on stage with an electric. Not true. The, the well, guy- exactly. I'm like, why? What is that? where is that mindset coming from? Is because I'm a woman? Mm. It's like, wh- have have men in the industry made me feel over time that I shouldn't be up there with an electric if I can't shred? You shred songwriting. And don't ever <laughs> limit yourself well, with that. Do, that, do, you know, know, do you know Orathani? Or I don't know if I'm saying her name right. Yep. Or, oh, yes, yeah. You know, she's a shredder. Yeah. Uh, the guy that made this logo is an awesome songwriter, Stephen Fiore. Do you know him? I recognize the name. So he's, he's pretty big in his world, and he always does. like It's, it's never like a normal brand. It's like some huge different brand electric but, mm. but, he, but he does tremolo mm. but he, you know it's solo 
and it's just nice. different. It's just different. Yeah, it's it adds cool. a different tone to your acoustic put, set. Put the put the capo up on like the tenth and then do one of those really pretty chords. You yeah. know what I mean? That's very songwritery. Yeah. I love when he does it, so it's good. Yeah, so I'm I'm probably I don't know if I I'm putting the acoustic into retirement. I'm really I'm really embracing does, does, my electric. Does she have a name? Uh no she doesn't. Oh, okay. Actually, let's call her Rosie. Rosie? How appropriate. There it's you also go. the name of my grandma's walker. Rosie? Rosie. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So what's the name of your car? Your car has a name. Oh, Baby Avocado. Yeah, Baby Avocado. It's green. You gave me a really funny story about it, too. Oh, yeah. A bunch of um, homeless people stole my car yeah. last year, um, and they did awful things in it. Baby Cotto. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it a deep clean. Yeah, but, but this, it's, it's a joke, right? Yeah. Well, th- I don't know if I should repeat the joke yeah, you, part. Oh, you can, I don't care. Anyway, but you got me good. You I know? got you, you good. Did, I, I was like, I huh? punked all my friends. I'll, and you go, by the way, I'm just kidding. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and we just had a couple of drinks, too. I was laughing pretty hard. <laughs> that was funny. But they truly did steal it. Oh, wait. It actually got stolen. Yeah, but the whole joke about the orgy, that was yeah, a yeah, joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually got stolen. I thought the whole yeah. thing was a joke. That's yeah. got to be from a movie. I feel it's like that's from, from the movie. movie The Other Guys. It is. With Will Ferrell. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, yeah. they left a, a note. The worst part, they left a note nope. inside the car written on a piece of cardboard. <laughs> said, thanks for the F shack. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I'm glad to know that uh, Baby Avocado is still... Um, healthy. She's a woman now. <laughs> Indeed. Oh my god. God, you're killing us. <laughs> I don't know if I want to continue down this road. <laughs> Dude, All you're right. killing me. Can I hit you with a lightning round? Yeah. Okay. Any collaborations you'd like to happen, alive or dead? Mm, Patty Griffin. Is that a, is that? Forgive me. Is that alive or dead? Oh, she's alive. Okay. Yeah. How about okay. someone who is no longer with us? Hmm, Patsy Cline. Mm. I, somehow I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> That's awesome. How early have you been songwriting? And, um, yeah, how long have you been writing songs? Mm, 14? I guess I've been doing, like, little poems since I was about 9 or 10. Okay, cool. Yeah. But writing songs since I was about 13. Wow. Started on poetry. Yeah. <laughs> moved to music. Mm-hmm. What set you apart from the crowd when you first started out? What do you feel like it was your big moment where you were like, I am songwriting now? Mm, I do feel that... Um, or was it gradual? I, I guess when I started playing in Toronto, I, 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 I'm very thankful for my voice. I know that I have a different voice, a unique voice, and I felt like that's the one thing that set me aside from from my peers. It's like I have... I'm not trying to sound like anyone else. I have I have something that's uniquely me. I love that. What's your biggest lesson that you can share? Hmm. From um, your experience. Don't date your bandmates. That is a very <laughs> poignant one. Yeah. Very important. Um, <laughs> Only if it's necessary. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> it sounded like it was necessary for you. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this last that's album. That's true. So. True hate to say it um <laughs> and uh what's the most surprising part of this industry you're in mm, uh the most surprising part of the industry is um how supportive everyone is hmm. um i guess in in toronto especially we had some cool friends i met at you know, hotel cafe they seemed like super nice friends oh uh, like and fans of you and they were songwriters too. Right? Oh yeah, everyone is so supportive. In Toronto, it was just a a big happy family. Everyone lived down the street from each other and I just didn't I just assumed it would be different in LA because it felt like oh this is a big city, this is big leagues, but as soon as I arrived here everybody was just welcomed me and um that's been really beautiful. That's that's what I love about LA. Awesome. Love it. Last lightning round question. What's the next project you're most excited for? And where do you see yourself in the next five years? Well, I'm making a new album right now um, with Jim Bryson. So um, we've been working on it in Canada, and he's coming here next month to finish it. And, um, yeah, I really just want to get this one done really quickly. Uh, Which studio? Um, We're just using, like, a home studio. Cool. I mean, people would be so surprised. Sometimes that's what you can just do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. um, 
he has he has a studio in Ottawa that we've been using. But um, and so I guess in the next five years, um, I'd like to be at a place where I'm just doing music, where I'm surviving off just music and. Don't say surviving, thriving. Thriving. There That's go. a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to be touring more. I would love to be um, playing to bigger audiences. I would love to be a support act for artists that I look up to. Um, yeah, I have a lot of plans for the future. I have a lot of dreams, so i just going to keep trucking and keep making the best music I can. Let's do a show together. Yeah. 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 Okay. You definitely yeah. gained one fan today. I'll buy a ticket. So. <laughs> okay. There you go. The numbers are skyrocketing. <laughs> have, have you? Have you? Just because living here, it was a good moment for us. Have you done the Troubadour yet? I have not. You know, that used to be a, an original Americana venue. Was oh yes, yeah. Back in the day, that <coughs> was like an open mic. Like yeah. Linda James Ronstadt. Brown. Or not James Brown. Uh, James Taylor, I think. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it was Americana. Mm-hmm. You know. It's like the, what's that documentary, the Laurel Canyon one? Or oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. the uh, the Linda Ronstadt documentary mm-hmm. talks about that. Yep. When she would be down there most nights with the Eagles. Those were her roommates at Crazy. the time. Crazy. Insane. They lived on the beach in Santa Monica, and they each paid $100 a month. <laughs> That's crazy. Different world back then. Yeah. Uh, you know, San Diego's getting pretty darn expensive, too. You yeah. Know? Yeah. They're saying it's getting more expensive than L.A. Really? Because everybody, cause everyone's leaving L.A. going to San Diego. So, huh. anyway, whatever. No but, comment. Yeah. <laughs> he, lives, he lives in San Diego. <laughs> oh, does he? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Well, uh, you know, we got a couple more minutes left. Um, <clears throat> like, do, 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 did you have a show last night? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I guess I did. <laughs> I'm just, just rock and roll. Uh, yeah. just, I can't remember <laughs> anything <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but you've just been wake doing up in a different place. And, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you, you, you've been doing like some cool showcases. Yeah, I'm in this new thing where I'm just saying yes to everything. Cool. None of these gigs pay. <laughs> but I just say yes because I... I want to be playing. So the other night I played this um, this thing called Second Draft LA. It's basically actors, um, script writers, um, and directors. They get together every week, and they take turns reading 10 pages from each other's scripts oh, and cool. acting them out. I love that. And so wow. every week they have a new artist come in to play two songs, and it was the best night. Everyone was so supportive. It was the most lively audience, and, yeah, I made some new friends and some new fans, and... Tomorrow night I'm playing the Belasco. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. You guys should come. Um, it's like a ki- there's food, there's theater tours, and I'm playing. Daniel Blake is playing. Cool. Yeah. So that's what's going on. Nice. Is, is cool, Rosie cool. gonna make an appearance? Yes, I'm bringing her. Lovely. <laughs> I'm nice. taking her out. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> taking her <laughs> taking out on the town. She's my Valentine. Oh, there you go. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Oh, um, well, you know, we'd love that you came on. Uh, you know, let's 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 put on a show together. That'd be cool. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. I I mean, Hotel Cafe is always a spot, but I mean, I don't. I mean, my first gig and you just played there. I think, or you playing my first gig ever was Genghis Cohen. Oh yes. I was twenty one. Okay. Uh, and it was really funny. I. Uh, this girl, my college girlfriend, just broke up with me, and I was so sad. Aww. It was my first time in Hollywood, and yeah. I, that's when I took the Amtrak up, and I ate. Uh, I remember I ate that story with Rafa where I, I ate shit because I was looking at the train station. Anyway, I, <laughs> I would take the train station up here, and uh, and this Uber just came out, and my friends, like, you got to download Uber until you get around, and I tipped the guy cash, and he's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "It's for you, sir." He's like, "All right, <laughs> asshole," you know. Like, and then and then my guitar case broke, so I'm carrying it. I got my luggage. I had like an Airbnb. I had a manager at the time, and. You can stay this Airbnb free. It was cool. Had tickets like Jimmy Kimmel backstage. Wow. It was it was a fun experience, but I was all sad. And mm. so I had the gig against Cohen, and the the sound guy. I guess he it was like a, a songwriter back in the day. Had a huge publishing deal, mm. and he's like completely set up, and he just does sound for fun. And oh. he could tell I was sad. He was, "Why are you sad?" I was like, "My girlfriend just broke up with me." He's like, "I'm gonna take you around," and he like teaches oh. at MIT, and then he's just like sound guy. At like I think. Uh, some other spot downtown and he thought I was moving there and it was really funny he's like hey man like you know you can start tomorrow you can be my sound assistant you would pay this much da, da, da. I was like oh I don't I'm not moving here and he's like oh why the hell did you come you got all pissed <laughs> at me I was like I don't know man but it was cool King's Con was my first gig it was cool it was like some really cool songs I, I did a show once with Christopher Cross and uh his key player played with Tracy Chapman mm. and she played with Christopher Cross, obviously. 
Kiki Esben. She's a great American singer. Her dad was the Tin Man. What? And so she played with me that night. It was really cool. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. The Tin Man. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should do an acoustic night at Genghis Cohen. Yeah, you know, that room, have you been there? It's an amazing Asian fusion restaurant, too, by the way. So like, delicious. Yeah, so good. But the room What did is, the Tin Man need? He needed something. Oh, a heart? A heart. He needed a heart. Did he ever get that? At the end. Okay. Right? <laughs> All right? <laughs> He's like, thank God. <laughs> Woo, oh, you know, I didn't know uh, how it ended. This, this interview just got saved. <laughs> <laughs> um... No, but uh, the King is Cohen room is dope. It's like a little church. It's a great songwriter room. I'd love are, to check are, it out. Are, did you just play there? Are you playing coming up? Yeah, that was that was the the writer night. This, was it good? Like it was yeah, it's been sound. years since I've been there. Great sound. Cool. I loved it. Yeah, we should just do an acoustic night there, you and I. Yeah, and we could get like a then we should get we could, we could do like a bill. Mm-hmm. I, you know, dude, I miss doing rounds. I miss rounds so much. Yeah, I love rounds. Because then it makes it easy on all of us, too. Yes. We can all make a joke in between it. Maybe someone's playing lead with somebody. Yeah. And we can all pull in. That's a small room, too. Yeah. And you can pull in all your friends and you sell it out. You know? Maybe we should start an in-the-round event yeah. there. No one else does it. Let's do it. I feel like no one... Let's do it. Boom. I feel like no one's hustling, man. Like, that'd be that'd be a fun let's project. Let's hustle. Yeah, let's do it. That'd be cool. And then, you know, then you can take a break from it. Do it for a while. Build it up. And then, you know, eventually people are like, oh, I'm not coming again. Mm. You, you can burn it out, you know? So it's cool to take a break with it. That'd yeah. be cool. We, the Boons will get that involved. Yeah. You know? We'll all get wasted. I'll, you know? I'll bring the government of Canada. There you go. <laughs> bring them. Free anyway. health care yeah. for everyone. Just tossing out health care to <laughs> And well. sushi rolls. Genghis Khan's great. <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, any uh, anything you want to plug? How can we find you? Um, well, you can just look up Jada Kelly on Instagram. Um and my website is darthjada.com. Okay, cool. May the folk be with you. <laughs> That's great. I love Wait, that. Thank you so and much for you. coming. And with you. <laughs> 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 You're killing it. Thanks for coming. Thank Boom. you. Yay. Yay.